Hey folks, it's Stover here. How are you? Happy Saturday. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk about Chapter 5 in Privilege, Seeing Ourselves, last week. I'm sorry about that. We got sort of sidetracked and, you know, there's so much material and so little time. So I was trying to write out some summaries for you, and to be honest, I just can't write anymore <laughs> right now. I have so much grading to do and reading to get through your papers. So what I thought I'd do is I would just sort of record some thoughts about Chapter 5 in the event that you want to sort of follow along and, um, you know, get out of the chapter what I would, uh, would have lectured on and discussed with you in person, okay? So with that in mind, here we go. So Chapter 5, Privilege, Seeing Ourselves. Um, chapter Learning Beowulf and Jaws, right? So basically, this chapter is about the way in which the education system at St. Paul's teaches students that they are exceptional. Now, they do this in a couple different ways. One of the ways that they do it is that they help or facilitate students crossing class boundaries when they... Um, watch TV or go to the movies or go to the opera or go see an MIA concert um, or, you know, in my days, like maybe they would go to see Beastie Boys and they would go to the opera. So they're consuming culture across class lines. They're also consuming culture across racial, not Rachel, racial and ethnic boundaries. So hip hop music, um, urban uh, music and culture is something that the students are consuming alongside high society blue blood type culture. Um, what he says on page 151, today's elites in that first, uh, in the second paragraph on the page, today's elites share not just a cultural propensity to be omnivorous, but also a capacity to do and appreciate many things. They have the time and resources to explore broadly, cultivating not a class character, but an individual one. So it's not about the fact that they're upper class. It's that they're thinking, oh, well, I can do this because I'm special and there's something special about me. If you go on to page um, 152, then, Khan sort of talks about the difference how by taking on these cultural attributes of other groups, what they're doing is they're once again making privilege a very like embodied sense of ease and they're also sort of taking away from the notion that they um, inherited these positions so once again we sort of see that their privilege gets hidden through their ability to like rap stars um so if you start to go through the chapter then, in the first subsection under the audacity of capacity, you have this big argument about what the students are actually studying. And they're taking these courses that aren't really high school courses. They're more like AP or college level courses. And some of the descriptions of these courses are, aren't really something you would even do in graduate school. I mean, there's no way that you could actually do the kinds of things that they're trying to get students to do at St. Paul's. However, in thinking and proposing these types of crazy courses, what they're doing is they're, they're playing on this idea of Plato, right? And Khan on page 158 talks about at the top of the page, he talks about education. So quote, in short, education is not teaching students that they don't know. Rather, it is about teaching them how to think their way through the world or in Plato's terms, how to turn on the light, quote unquote, right? So they're asking students not to name specific things that they know about the world, but how do they relate to the world, which is actually kind of what we're doing in sociology in some regards, right? We're trying to understand our positions within society and the way in which we as social actors and individuals um, you know, relate to the meso and the macro, you know, dialectical process by which all of that takes place. But in the process, what happens is that, at St. Paul's at least, is that students aren't really getting the material that they know. Like some of these, um, if you look down further on the page, on page 158, 
um, an alumnus told me after he finished his freshman year at Harvard, I don't actually know much. I mean, I don't know how to put it. When I'm in class, all these kids next to me know a lot more than I do, like about what actually happened in the Civil War or what France did in World War II. I don't know any of that stuff. But I know something they don't. It's not facts or anything. It's how to think. That's what I learned in Humanities. So what comes up for me, and that's, again, at the bottom of page 158, so if you think about that statement, you know, what does that really sound like? Well, that sounds like that Riverdale school where all the white and Asian kids were taking the special class where they got to learn how to think. Well, that's the same thing that this student is describing here. He's like, well, I don't really know who the president of France was, but I know I could think about it, or I know I could think about, well, what does it mean to be the president of France? So there's sort of pros and cons to that, right? I mean, in high school, you need a certain set of knowledge to get through, and critical thinking is important. So, you know, where do we fall on the continuum then in terms of what we're doing? Now, the other thing that's happening is that they're sort of expecting that students are just going to be phenomenal. And so students have this attitude that anybody who does something is the best and the brightest that can actually be. So um, they, so jump over to page 162 then, right? Um, so he talks about it as an audacity of capacity. Um, privileged to quote, these privileged students are made into elites by the interactions that consecrate them. So it's constantly about that, you know, sociology of everyday interaction thing that's happening. Um, there's also this audacity, right? The audacity of this system is shocking and ingenious, asking big questions that seems profound, but you cannot be wrong. The point is to develop a voice and interpretation in a way of articulating it. So if students can actually talk the talk, right? Think back to Carla, like, oh, I'm just going to bullshit my way through this and give you what you think you want. Well, that's a little bit what's going on here. So then we jump over into this argument, right, about the myth of the exceptional. And this is where, like, whatever somebody does, they must be the best in the entire world. And part of this is because they are at St. Paul's. They live in this experience where, you know, exceptionalism seems like something everybody can do. Because if you're being taught that you're special and you've earned your place in a really special place, then you're not going to have the same perspective um, that other people are going to have about you know, a variety of abilities. So, um, uh, for instance, um, let's take a look at, and at the bottom of page 163, uh, Khan says, this kind of assumption that the best student in each particular subject at St. Paul's was probably the best person in the world was widespread. And then he goes on to give some examples about that. Jason and Jimmy, Stephen, um, the artist he introduced earlier were all considered quote the best at St. Paul's and therefore must be the talent of internet must be a talent of international caliber unquote page 164. Um, well Khan I think importantly goes on to state that you know being very good as we all know is very different from being the best. So you can be good at something but it doesn't make you the best. It doesn't make you um, Phenomenal, And anybody who saw The Social Network with, um, you know, the Wonder Twin guys who do the, um, you know, the rowing thing. What were their names? Winklevoss. He calls them Winklevi. The Winklevies. Um, you know, they thought they were exceptional and they came in six in the Olympics, right? So, I mean, it doesn't matter how good looking or tall or, you know, if you go to Harvard or not. Like, there's still probably somebody better than you. Um, but what's important in that is that, and this is in that same paragraph, um, on page 167, that long paragraph in the middle, Khan says, they assume that the world around them is the whole world. They assume that the whole world around them is the whole world, unquote. So there's a provincialism in this. There's a way in which students are just thinking, hey, we're it. Everything about the world that I need to know is right here. Well, eventually that's going to sort of bite them in the butt, right? Because they're going to get out into the world and they're going to figure out that they're not as special as they think they are.